Well, we've we've done it. I mean, we're 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 at the end of our little journey here today. We're we've reached the end, and it's see if we can uh, not only read the last part of Second Isaiah, but also uh, have a little discussion about what perhaps we our <clears throat> takeaway is. Well, I need to find the text first. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay. Were there any comments or questions about last week that people wanted to start with? Reflections. Okay, then. Shall we start? Uh, Terry, you want to read for us the first section, 1 to 5? We're in Isaiah 55. Sure. Oh, all who are thirsty, come for water. Even if you have no money, come, buy food and eat. Buy food without money, wine and milk without cost. Why do you spend money for what is not bread, your earnings for what does not satisfy? Give heed to me and you shall eat choice food and enjoy the richest viands. Incline your ear and come to me. Hearken, and you shall be revived, and I will make with you an everlasting covenant, the enduring loyalty promised to David, as I make him a leader of peoples, um, a prince and commander of peoples. So you shall summon a nation you did not know, and a nation that did not know you shall come running to you for the sake of the eternal, your God, the Holy One of Israel, who has glorified you. <clears throat> Terry, usually, usually you have some pre pre uh, pre <laughs> pre recorded comments and pre thought of comments. Yes. <laughs> well, actually I was reading this same um section in, you know, just a different version in the Bible that I usually read every day. And you know, it's always similar but kind of gives a little bit different Thing, that whole idea of um, why spend money on what does not satisfy? Why spend your wages and still be hungry? So the, you know, it's like the the word of the Lord that, you know, there's something about that that really and truly satisfies us. And, you know, just listening. I mean, that's kind of throughout scripture is that, you know, God is what we really need to be satisfied I like the way this says it, though. The second part about, you know, um, a, you shall summon a nation you didn't know and a nation you didn't know shall come running. That doesn't, I don't know. I'm not sure what that means. I, I don't have any thoughts on that. In fact, I have questions about that. What, what does that mean? Hmm. Others? Uh, I was just going to second what Terry just said. I was wondering what this nation was, summon a nation you did not know and that did not know you. I was wondering if he if he is referring to a specific nation. If so, he certainly doesn't say what it is um, or whether it's any nation. I don't know. So I'd be interested in your thoughts. <laughs> Well, later in the in the verses, he speaks about Israel. Don't know if he's speaking about a nation or a people. No, oh, but it's talking about foreign nations. Nations. They didn't know you, and now they'll come running to join you. So here's, some, here's something that, that I find in the interfaith, uh, the Christian Jewish dialogue, um, about when I happen to use the word Mashiach or Messiah, um, Many Christians are kind of surprised that 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 I we have that in in our belief system. It's very different my belief system than opposed to others. But what have Jews meant until the 19th century, at least, um, or early 20th century? What have they meant when they talk about Mashiach coming? Well, obviously they don't mean Jesus, right? And but this helps us understand the the foundation for what 
became the project of, of Christianity. Uh, they mean that a king will be anointed who is from the house of David, will come and lead the people of Israel in battle against the nations of the world who do not accept that God is one, and eventually will, I hate to say it, will rule the world. There's different versions of that. There's the more rationalists like Maimonides who said, it'll be like this world, just it'll be peaceful. And there are those that see it as being more like, you know, paradise. But that's like a, that's a basic tenet of, of early Judaism based on scripture, based on prophetic, a collection of ideas from, from, from prophetic writings. And this is a representative of part of that. Um, and, 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 and it's not pretty. It's, it's, not, it's not the kind of liberalism, uh, hu humanist Judaism that many of us grew up with or moved into. It's very, very chauvinistic. And I think that that's important for us to recognize as the background here, not necessarily to espouse as our own understanding, but to re realize that that's in the background here. Well, how, how do you react to that, Stephen? Well, does this uh, help resolve uh, the question about the nations and what's being referred to? I mean, I know it, it's connected to the promise to the Davidic promise, but um, yeah, I would say it's the nations of the world that will accept will accept that oneness. So, David. Mm -hmm. um, where, to me, I think the line that is that that is the most puzzling is, and I have to read the English because I don't know what the meaning is in Hebrew. But it says, "A nation that did not know you shall come running to you." To me, I got my first interpretation was it is a nation that didn't know you is coming rushing up to you to embrace you. And so I didn't necessarily think of this sort of going to war or chauvinistic or conquering or anything like that. I just thought it meant a, a nation is coming to you to embrace you. <laughs> is that, or is that a totally wrong interpretation? No, I, I understand that nation as the nations of the world, of, of, of the others of the world. I don't, I don't understand it in an ethnic sense of point of view. But that you know, it, it it is a difficult phrase. The Hebrew is is hein goy lo teda, right? And and indeed, a a nation that you do not know, tikra, you know, will will you'll, you'll call to them v'goy lo yedauha yedecha, and it, it's it uses the singular goy, as mm -hmm. which is nation, but I think it's I think it's a collective for people for humanity. Okay. I thought about whole um whole in the verse one through five, all who are thirsty come for water. It made me think about at the Passover Seder, when we say, let all who are hungry come and eat. And if you don't have money, come and eat, whatever, you know, where, however you are, just come and eat. And, and also, Malka, the eating there is, although we, many of us have, have gotten used to saying it as we're opening our homes to the poor people who are mm -hmm. hungry. It's mm -hmm. really the Seder is not about eating, is it? No. It's not about satisfying, it's not about nourishment, it's about spiritual, it's a, it's symbolic eating. And that way it would, would be very similar, of course, to the Eucharist and mm -hmm. the symbolic eating. Mm -hmm. I I do think that we see in the book of Acts the um the understanding that the ethne, the Gentiles, will be, you know, grafted in to the vine of Israel as, as wild shoots. And that seems to me, you know, at least in hindsight, the early church would look back at texts like this and, and identify themselves, you know, that early Jewish Christian community uh, with, with, with such text. And and the idea of, of the second Samuel chapter seven promise to the Davidic line that will rule forever. They also identified Jesus as Messiah uh, in those terms. And yet 
as we saw a couple of weeks ago, those of us who went to a Lenten service, and, and I think uh, we referred to this earlier, but once Peter, you know, identifies Jesus when he asks, who do people say that I am? What's the source of my life? Peter says, well, you're Messiah. And then uh, immediately after, he goes back to Isaiah 53 thinking, where, okay, great. You got it, but the kind of rule is going to be bottom up. It's going to start with washing feet, and I'm going to be killed, and, and I'm going to be uh, tortured by the powers that be. And so I, I think, you know, there is resonance here for, for that community in the early going. And, of course, uh, they lost that vision early on. I mean, it's always there, but the idea of the suffering servant quickly became the ruling conqueror, you know, as, as maybe the expectation was, at least with Peter, let's say. So I, I think there's that as well. Don. Yes, sir. It's such a broad mm -hmm. uh, and wide invitation. And the picture I have uh, and my imagination is whoever it is is standing on Mount Sinai inviting the nations of the world to finally recognize the values of of ethics uh, promulgated by these traditions. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I like the idea of or the words, why do you spend money for what does not bread uh, your earnings from, for what does not satisfy, give heed to me. I mean, so whatever the word of uh, satiation or salvation is, it's free. It doesn't cost any money. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't cost an, any uh, element of power. It is, it is almost accepting us as, as, as we were created in God's uh, image. Good. Yes, Megan. I just have a question. I was looking up the idea of Mashiach in Judaism, and I read, and is it true that Mashiach was not ever mentioned in Torah in the first five books. And it's, it's, did it develop later? Well, it, it depends how you see the five <laughs> books as being, if, if we don't necessarily assume the five books of Moses are earlier than the other books that come afterwards. They were written yeah. later. So, but it, it is true that in the Torah, there is no, there, there's no reference to Mashiach. That's something that develops either later or independently or different, <laughs> not mentioned. It's read into certain parts of the Torah by later, by rabbinical commentary, but it, no, it's not. It's a thing that you do have Mashiach, but the Mashiach, the anointed in in the in the Torah is more about the priest, the high priests who are the priests who are anointed, the ones who were chosen. And you have later about the kings, the flesh and blood kings who are anointed. Hence the word Mashiach. But is it, what you're talking about, Mashiach, is a product of prophetic literature. Yes, yeah. yeah. That you were going to be here by 12. Go ahead. Yeah. There's just, it's not the same, but there are like two, three pages of the Babylonian Talmud that mm -hmm. talk about. Um, why? Because the Mishnah says, if you don't believe in the re resurrection of the dead, then you have no place in the world to come. Right. And so um, there's this long conversation about the rabbis, everybody vying for position of where exactly in the Torah, in the five books of Moses, does it talk about Tchiyata Metin, re resurrection of the dead? And um, and you know when a conversation, a debate goes on for such a long time with everybody claiming, you know, it's from here, no, it's from here, is it probably nobody's right? Right, it's, it's just I think not that's there. Maybe where I was looking, yeah, yeah, because it was connected with resurrection of the dead. Yeah.
Okay. Hi. Uh, Stephen Byrne, you want to read 6 to 11 for us? Yes. <clears throat> Seek God while you can. Call out while God is near. Let the wicked give up their ways, the sinful their plans. Let each one turn back to God so as to be pardoned, to our God who freely forgives. For my plans are not your plans, nor are my ways your ways, declares God. But as the heavens are high above the earth, so are my ways high above your ways, and my plans above your plans. For as the rain or snow drops from heaven and returns not there, but soaks the earth and makes it bring forth vegetation, yielding seed for sowing and bread for eating, so is the word that issues from my mouth. It does not come back to me unfulfilled, but performs what I propose, achieves what I sent it to do. I guess I'm I'm struck by two things there. One is 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 this uh, idea of turning from their ways, and how God, who freely forgives, there's that just that grace that's there, you know, so as to be pardoned. Um, and then the the fact that God's ways are not man's ways. They're so high above and so hard to understand. Uh, there's a place in Romans where Paul goes on a sort of a whole, he, he's, he's talking about the Jewish people and he ends it with kind of throws his arms up and says, who can understand the mind of God? His ways are far above our ways. And this seems to echo back to this. The, the, I mean, my question is that, does this resonate to uh, to us in our own lives? Reading these words, are they comfort? Um, does it indicate that? I'll say this, but um, does it indicate God is in charge um, to some degree of of everything that happens in the world? Um, and I I don't want to say that because I did. I don't want to acknowledge that the Holocaust was was uh, something that God intended or let happen, um, but I I do think it's uh, it has immense spiritual depth. This passage. Well, thank you for your sensitivity, Don. Um, just to give you a in in the progressive. Although there were Jews and there are Jews that still hold very extreme uh, ultra-Orthodox Jews that would say that, yes, the Holocaust was a punishment of God, people, because they accepted secular modernity, etc., or Zionism, uh, or lack of the, that is, of course, the minuscule few. And in general, what progressive liberal Jews would say is that uh, who do still espouse that God controls what's in the world, that there is part of this oneness of God control, they'll say, yes, but there's always human free choice as well. It's that, David, that. You know, I was uh, reading something that uh, Eichmann's attorney used that as a defense of Eichmann in the Nuremberg trials, hmm. and which I, that just turned me off when I, when I read that, but. Um, okay. But but back to this scene here in particular, you know, we have restaurants that are um, from farm to table. So this first section of Isaiah is from table to farm uh, kind of thing. You know, <laughs> the, the table, this description of this of of this spiritual food and then going back again to the to the farm or the place where it grows this this kind of viewing of of, of creation, this viewing of the oneness of God, the oneness of creation the oneness of God's word of, of human behavior. Um, if Don, if you're asking the question, do I, I find this section of Isaiah, second Isaiah more relevant than I have most of the other one, not more relevant, but very, very relevant to try to understand exactly this idea. And it's not about whether this is the same science that we know, whether the water just stays in the ground or whether it actually goes up to the, to the sky. This is about just understanding this this entire this whole it's it's a holistic approach to life. Um, 
Um, I like the uh, comparison or the metaphor, I guess, of um, the weather or the climate, the rain and snow falling down and resulting in uh, this vegetation. So the word of the Lord also, uh, it says, uh, does not come back to me unfulfilled. To me, that kind of means not necessarily that everything God says literally comes to pass or is performed, but that his word in general, in a very broad sense, makes a difference. Just as the rain and the snow obviously have a great effect on the uh, growing of vegetation, the growing of crops. So uh, the word of God makes um, a di makes a difference in the world, but in a in a very broad sense. David, the the other thing that strikes me in this, and even going back uh, in the first part, one to five, is is just this thing seems to just explode with generosity about all kinds what of things. Doing? Buying with buying without money. You know, all of the essentials, water, wine, milk, bread, God freely forgives. There's this generosity that just seems to come through all of the words here of, um, of God reaching out. <laughs> yeah, I like that. That's good. And it's, it's, it's universal too, I think. I mean, it's not, not for one people, it's for man, people kind. <laughs> I don't know why, but I have a little bit of a problem with the statement who, who to our God who freely forgives. I'm not so sure that God always freely forgives. You want to do you want to expound? Well, because there's punishments. There's there's so many punishments that are given. For example, um, the punishment of, of a father it, 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 upon his son and his son. And I I I have a, I don't know quite how to explain it, but I somehow that hit me that I don't always think that God freely forgives. I could be my feeling. So, you know, Rita Claire, you often bring us back to the family model, right? Mm -hmm. the, 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 the structure of family. <clears throat> and um, as someone who raised many children and many grandchildren and many, many, many great grandchildren, because you're still- I didn't the, raise those. Well, <laughs> you're still the matriarch of the family. <laughs> Um, but you involved and you talk to them. Um, I think very often we will say things like everything's going to be all right. Even though we don't necessarily mean that, we don't believe that necessarily. We we don't always say uh, exactly what happens in reality we, when we're trying to encourage, when we're trying to not lead to despair. And, and perhaps that's the, the prophet's way of um, you know, uh, uh, of saying it, even though this prophet was witness to great punishment, but now's the flip side. Now's the upside. Now's the the end of that period for his for his messages. Now things are going to be better, and so looking forward, you're looking forward to a rosier future. Could it be perhaps that's one way to understand this? Somehow, I think there's a price that de that needs to be paid for everything. I don't know. Some prices are more uh, more than others, but um, uh, life isn't easy, and I think we have to take a accountability for some of our our decisions. Um, I I don't think we always need to to um, be punished or, or suffer for some of our of bad decisions, I think there's a way of of um, of, of uh, making things better. But I think forgiveness doesn't always come so readily 
so quickly. I think forgiveness comes over sometimes over a period of time. Good, thank you. I saw movement in the Loomis window. Yeah, go ahead, please. Well, and, and her comment is kind of the same section and I appreciated the wording of um, give up their their ways, give up sinful ways and stuff. And in my um, version, it says change their way of thinking. And I really appreciated when I ran into that in terms of repentance, that that's really what repentance means is to change your way of thinking. It doesn't mean to say, you know, just, I'm sorry. It means like, turn around, go back, go the other direction. And I think, especially for humans, we're looking at forgiveness. I'm going to expect somebody to like, show me a change of thought, a change of actions, probably much longer than God would require from somebody, because you might say that you're going to change your ways and you're going to reform, but you know, you got to show me, you've got to prove it to me. And it would probably take a long time to happen. But that idea of just changing your way of thinking and turning back to God, um, to me is a, a much, it's a real positive kind of repentance idea. I, I think we've mentioned before the word for repentance in Hebrew, tshuva, it has to do with not necessarily going the other direction, but getting back on track. On, on the, getting back on the way. Uh, yeah. uh, Rita, Rita Claire's comments uh, remind me of, of a, a one-liner I'm fond of, and that is that uh, we, are, we are punished uh, by our sins, not for our sins. The idea being there's a, there's a human consequence to our, to our, you know, our violent ways uh, often. And, and so, also, that segues for me into a, this invitation into abundance. It, it's a theology of abundance, not scarcity, as some, some call it. But when you get to 6 and 11, to 11, seek God while you can. That, that suggests to me a, a, an agency uh, that we have, you know, a, a responsiveness to, to, to listen and to respond and to be in this dialogical uh, rapport in a way that, um, you know, is, is, is part of uh, being, be, becoming part of uh, the community in a, in a, in a healthy way, not, uh, not one who, who robs the community. So I, I, I think uh, this appeal to, to our, our heart, to, to listen and respond is, is marked for me. I mean, that's why we study the word of God, isn't it? To, to cement that bond and to have the faculties to affect change in our lives. I, I would think and that's how valuable this book is. I mean, not Isaiah, but all of Scripture. I'm going to give you a, a partial, I'm going to do a partial pushback, Don. It's not exactly pushback on what you said, but it's kind of a, a spin on it. Um, and this came up uh, in a conversation I had yesterday with somebody who just found our community. Um, when I study, I'll speak for myself, when I study, I'm not looking for authority. I'm looking for inspiration. And so Word of God, we talk, the, the Word of God has come up quite a bit here, usually not um, in the mouths of the Jewish participants. It's not something we use, Word of God, so much. We don't, uh, and I think that our, our um, the language we speak about Scripture is, is, um, is well this uh, as i would paraphrase it well this happens to be one guy and he's a guy one guy's particular uh thinking about god at that moment in which he lived right it's uh, not the word of god it's a perhaps a word of god but i'm looking for for inspiration and so don the pushback would be for me that when i get to certain certain passages 
and this is not one of them, but other passages that we had in Second Isaiah and that we have in Scripture in general, I will say that's exactly what I'm not going to do. Yeah, but don't you think you pass that through your own filters? Um, I mean, this is a, this is a nurturing section of Isaiah um, that is worthy of study and worthy of, of um, its effect uh, on your own personal belief system. Um, if if we've gone deeper, the the idea of the generosity. The idea of the universality of this um, is something that I didn't appreciate before we had this discussion. Uh -huh. So this discussion is producing something for me that that wasn't there before, and and it's a, it it's affecting me. I I I like it. <laughs> you know? uh, yeah, yeah. So I, I shouldn't have used the terminology of pushback. Of course, that's your experience, and that's. And that's wonderful. Um, I, I think what I'm thinking of is the. I just came off of another call about, yeah, with progressive Zionist rabbis and and talking about the great challenges that there really is no such thing as liberal Zionism. And, and somebody asked, you know, what, what 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 do I do in the congregational level? And I shared with this person that we as a as an or as a group as a congregation or a we study together the book of Joshua right now. We're about two thirds through the book of Joshua and chapter by chapter. And I didn't do it for many years because I knew it would be difficult because just just like you're mentioning, Don, I don't study text without relating it to my life. Right. Well, how, what does it mean right now? And my life is not just my life, Lazar's life, but family life, community life, American life, Israeli life, world life. And so um, we, we, we see in scripture and God in the word of God. Some things in which we say, not my word, not my God. And that's fine. That's, in other words, what I'm saying, that's part of that. That's to me, that's the greatness of our conversation, the ability to say that. Um, but, but all in this context, though, with, with Jews and Christians sitting together, it's to let's hear a little bit about the word of God from others so that we might find, you know, some, some truth in it for ourselves. But yeah, that, that was kind of perhaps I, I was having too much of a multi-log in my mind going on right there. What you said and what we said 15, 20 minutes ago. David, this is a key verse, as you mentioned, uh, for uh, more conservative evangelical groups who, who, whose number one principle is, is that the Bible is the inerrant word of God. And so this text here, uh, the word of God that com it comes from God. It's inspired. It's inerrant. God doesn't make mistakes. So there's there's lots of assumptions woven into this. But what you end up with is, um, you know, kind of a I, I would call a very very rigid understanding and and uh, of this text as as the first principle for everything else. And often gets used in ways that, um, you know. I think I think you have to draw a distinction between inspiration and the humanness of an author. I, the inspiration part is beyond the author. Don, could you repeat that? I couldn't quite hear it. You said that. I'm, I'm sorry. I I think we have to separate. Um, the topic of inspiration from the human authors. Oh, author. Okay. Um, I think the inspiration is beyond the human author. He is just a, he or she is just a tool that forms these words. But it is through those words, I think, that something else surfaces. That's that's a binding has a binding quality to it. I don't know. That's what I think. Because people, you know, some people don't believe the Bible is literal. But and Don, I would I would just echo what you said in the sense that my experience in 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 when I read uh, scripture mindfully with an open heart, there are those numinous, uh, mysterious uh, moments of inspiration that where something pops anew uh, that, that feels more than just, you know. And, in a 
I think, Stephen, the whole concept of wisdom is is fed through this these words. Uh, you look at Proverbs, you look at Job, you look at uh, Ecclesiastes, um, you know, you, and I'm sure there are many other other uh, areas. Wisdom, the, the way of life that is according to perhaps God's plan for us is made clear by that study. Yeah, nice. Okay. I'm I'm sorry. I well, no nothing to apologize about. Anything else before we go on? Okay, Harold, you want to read twelve thirteen for us? Uh, yea, you shall leave in joy and be led home secure. Before you, mount and hill shall shout aloud, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the briar a cypress shall rise. Instead of a nettle, a myrtle shall rise. These shall stand as a testimony to God, as an everlasting sign that shall not perish. Uh, when I was uh, in seminary in yeshiva and somebody would get married and then afterwards also in the world that I was living in, the, the Orthodox Zionist world that I've referred to in previous meetings, um, this was the song that all the guys would sing kind of huddled in a huge circle, shoulder to shoulder kind of a thing, like think of a football kind of a huddle, but it's guys who are totally sweating because they've danced for hours with a, a band. And we would sing, Ki v'simcha te'itzeyu u'v'shalom tuvalun e'harim v'agvot I can't even, I don't even remember it anymore. I'm sorry. I should have looked for it, I think, but it was, it, there's something in me that's kind of blocked it out. But this is what we would sing at the end of a wedding before everybody went home. It's kind of a a, a theological way of, of salvation, thinking of salvation is kind of saying, may this wedding and the experience we had, again, all men together, the women were, you know, on the other side of the room, perhaps, um, singing and dancing together was spiritual. It was spiritual practice. And we see this as a form of bringing about this messianic vision. Uh, that pathos and that, that, that depth, unfortunately for me, gets lost in the liberal, in the progressive world. That ability to do that kind of, that, that kind of, have that kind of experience in the same way that it, I think in Christianity, in the progressive circles of Christianity, some of the that that maybe not, but that pathos is 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 lost. One of my attractions to to Teze and the community of brothers there is the ability to preserve some of that very very raw basic spiritual energy uh, without having the other side of that, which is being strict and enforcing the word of God on others. Um, so that's my own private personal memory here sharing with you about these last lines uh, um, and 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 again here's an example don of saying okay i hear what the text is saying may the future look so that these bad plants are replaced by the good plants and my updated version of that from the late 20th century is is why don't we look and see and, and instead revise how we see plants all plants are good in one way or another they all have their role to play in the ecosystem. Um, oh, David, you speak of that, and you look at the term here, uh, the replacement of um, of um, what, the thorns with the uh, cypress trees. Um, this, the symbolism of cypress trees is that its roots hold back water and prevents pollution. Um, I wish there could be uh, some uh, vehicle to explore the symbolism of the Bible's words in a, in an agricultural uh, an environment um, to see how how rich some of these words are when you dive down deep into them and see their their actual meaning and and uh, you know why they're used. Yeah, there, there's whole books about that, Don. By the way. Mostly in Hebrew. Mostly in Hebrew. Yeah, mostly in Hebrew because 
it's Israeli scholars and Israeli part of Israeli culture was to again renew the connection with the land by being experts at the flora and the fauna of the land and going back to the roots, the biblical roots, to try to identify. That's just an instrumental thing to identify what is the what does the biblical Hebrew mean when it when it's talking about a particular plant, and then lifting that up. Um, one of the things we do out here, Don, in the desert is a Torah trek. Uh, we try to do it in season. We go out uh, on a hike or into nature with a sheet like this, like the ones that I prepare for here, uh, with usually biblical and rabbinic texts, sometimes modern uh, Jewish philosophical texts. And we, I, I pick a theme that we do. The theme that we did last week, we went to the Andreas uh, Trail in the Indian Canyons Nature Reserve, um, where there's a, there's a, a number of uh, ancient they're they're old from a southern california view of, of these palm trees which are in which are indigenous to this particular part of, of the united states and uh we had a guest speaker talk about the you know the symbolism of palm trees in biblical literature and rabbinic literature um so those are the kind of things that that uh that actually do happen don but a lot of that a lot of the that literature is in hebrew and a lot of it is israeli I'm behind the door on that one. I can't read you. But I, there are still there's still books that you can find. You can you could Google. You'll find books that are that do. But but my point was a little bit different, Don. My point was that is that is that if there are there are bad plants that are mentioned in this section. May the bad plants turn into good plants. And what I would like to my messianic version is that we begin to understand that every plant is good. Every plant, every human being has good in them every every element of creation has something good in it anyway others they may be uh, in addition to the briar a cypress shall rise instead of instead of yeah because the metaphor is powerful right and and right. i love it as a, as a blessing at the end of a wedding i've never it just that, that could be very special. Um, it, by the way, the end of the Hebrew is even uh, employs the metaphor even more poetically, beautifully. Uh, the words that are translated here as an everlasting sign that shall not perish is um, as an everlasting sign that will not be cut down. The same word for cutting down a tree is is also perish. It, it can be understood as perish, but it's, but that's that, that's the beauty of poetry here as well. Um, and when Don studies, uh, completes his, his Hebrew studies, he'll be able to uh, give us more insights into those, th that kind of. The everlasting sign, I can understand as the rainbow from the, the promise to Noah. Others. How about some comments in general on this this part of our study? This uh, we'll send out a survey like we did last time after Acts to get some some feedback. We hope to do, but I think we're going to we're going to after taking a break of a few weeks, and we'll let you know. Um, I know I certainly need a break. This has been a, a, a particularly busy time for me, um, and um, and and we're going to go on with uh, the gospel according to John. And and explore that. That'll take us few for a long time. Um, so I before I, I want people please to to chime in. We've got plenty of time to do so. But I do want to mention again, as we do on all of our flyers, that this study is made possible in part by a grant that we get from the Jewish Federation of the Desert, in which um, uh, an annual grant. I hope we'll get it again going forward this year. Uh, that that enables us to specifically focus on study group study uh, with Jews and Christians together the texts that are sacred to both of our traditions sometimes that means text that's related just to one tradition like in the summer when we did Talmud or uh, going forward gospel according to John or, or big before the Talmud the Acts sometimes it's texts that we do together and we do it in this framework here um, on Wednesday mornings which I think we're going to move uh, up an hour or forward an hour no not forward move back whatever it is, go forward. Uh, go forward to make it an hour later. Uh, uh, is that what, meaning 1 p.m. Central time? Is that what it was, Stephen? Well, yeah, if if uh, if folks are okay with that, e either uh, 
I've got a standing 1130 now in, in Fredericksburg. And so I'm just trying either before or after that would be ideal. Yeah. And before would be a little bit too, uh, would be challenging from our point. I, I think Even after is great if, yeah. if, if it works, but yeah. 11 yeah. o'clock our time is good because that's when we start the Wednesday class as well. It's good in people's minds. That's confusion. But let, let's just go back a second. Do people want to reflect on anything the, the time we've spent over the last number of months doing the second Isaiah? David, th this is uh, the second sort of study that I've gone through with the group. And I can just say that both studies have just tremendously enriched my life and understanding about so many things. This one, a couple of things that, that stood out. There was a moment when it was the week you did the, um, <clears throat> had all of the folk dancing and all of the videos with that. And I think Sasha came on and, and said that when she sees that, she feels her connection to Israel. And that just, it was, Steve Kinney says is goosebumps, right? That just gave me goosebumps when she said that. Because this whole study has opened my eyes to all these other connections uh, <laughs> beyond what maybe my belief system was coming into it in terms of our connection to the sacred in terms of the connection to the people, to the land, to the city, to the prophet, to the history that was going on with what was happening with all of the nations there. And there's just such a, a seems to me, a bigger way of looking at things that way. And then the, the, la the last thing that sort of struck me, we had read one week, uh, we went into when Philip and the eunuch were having a discussion. And I thought that this eunuch's question has just stuck with me since then, where he says, because uh, I think this was part of our study, right? Tell me, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? And I think there were so many times we were asking those questions in here. So uh, it's just been really meaningful to participate in this. So I, I'm I'm really grateful for it. Well, thank you. Thanks for the comments. Uh, Sasha is sitting opposite me on the couch in her preferred position, smiling. Mm -hmm. Others? It's just a rare privilege, right, to, to have uh, this opportunity to uh, meet with, with uh, folks in the Or Ahmed Bar community and and a scattering of others around the country. And it's just a rare privilege that I don't take for granted. And, and I, I just, I don't, I don't, I, I want to keep reflecting on, on Isaiah, but at the same time, I wanted to just encourage folks that the gospel of John is a unique text for an inter uh, faith exploration. I mean, it runs the gamut for, for some, it's just a, a weird piece of Gnostic literature for others. It's a Jewish document for others. It's anti-Semitic for others. It's an, or it, it's, it's rich. And, uh, hopefully, you know, hopefully we'll, we'll all get to, uh, dive into that together sooner than later, uh, about, about Isaiah though. Yeah, it, it's, it got me into Heschel. It got me into, and then David, when you start after October 7th, the way you would take us inside of that, feel, those feelings uh, in light of Isaiah, it, it, uh, it's uh, been, been very strong for me. Thank you. Well, our st study is, oh, go ahead, Don. Yeah, I was going to say that I, I make every effort, a positive effort to be faithful. Uh, to come because it's enriching and because I, I genuinely like the people and what they say. Um, so it's a it's a rich class and a rich study. And I thank you for the effort that you put into it and Stephen puts into it and all the others uh, in their studies, what they bring to it too. Thank you. So not sure this is the same melody, but why don't we give this a try and see if this 
This is the one I was referring to. So I thought this girl was working out like crazy, yeah, well, but she wasn't. It. I met her yesterday at the gym and I asked her, how do you look so great? Dang, Dang girl. Not sure if that came through. I, it's it's a problem with with noise, but that actually was the Lubavitcher Rebbe of blessed memory, Rebbe Menachem Mendel Schneerson, and it, it's a totally different melody. But, and it, and it's not a video; it's just a picture of the Chassidim and the Farbregen. But uh, thank you, Sasha, anyway, for suggesting that. Um, but look at this is uh, this is the wonderful the wonderful part. So the word of God for me, in reaction to some of the the words that have been spoken to, the word of God for me is when people come together and they study text it, with with a a lofty uh, motivation of trying to do something sacred, something holy, of um, of understanding that the word of God can never be just one person's understanding of what that word of God is. It's got to be that. Uh, the the multi log the multi the multi word multi log of God, and uh, I want to thank everybody for being here. We'll be in touch with you. Um, uh, you can access at any time the the previous or or sp spread the word if people are interested to hear that with the thing we've done here. I don't think it's all that common that Jews and Christians come together at this um, so often, and and for such a long time, and in this in in this depth of study. Uh, and um, and so please feel free to share the links with others and the, the recordings. Um, any final words, Malka? You were kind of distracted. Is there something you'd like to add? Because no, I just thought that I just finished the seum for Baba um, Baba Mazia, and I just thought we should have a seum for this for uh -huh. doing forty to fifty five. So a seum is a party that's done in the yeshiva tradition of when you. When you finish a, a tractate of Talmud, then you actually make like a little party, a little uh, uh, sudat mitzvah. That's a sacred sacred meal with 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 some wine and some bread, break bread together. And um, so Malka just finished one for studying the tractate of one of the tractates of the Talmud. Um, if we were together, perhaps yes. Um, I don't know. We can think of it. Uh, I, I I I always like to think there there are very few. Tractates, there's no tractate, very few. I have never done a seum on a tractate of Talmud in my life because it's so hard. <laughs> it's so hard to persevere. But certainly let's think of that going forward. And uh, and perhaps maybe uh, folks will visit Palm Springs. We'll do something in person as well. Okay, everyone. Thank you. And uh, we'll be in touch with new dates and texts, etc. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye-bye. You're welcome. Thank you.